This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. The pressure falls and then it rises again through the shockwave here and that was characteristic of a far field N wave. The sonic boom behind the um, Concorde, for example, is because of this. All right. And I drew attention to the tremendous contrast between the supersonic case and the M equals zero entirely incompressible case, which looks like this. This is the pressure at this sharp corner here and sharp corner here completely different and um, people didn't understand that uh, in the early days of supersonic flight this is after the Second World War and uh, I mentioned to you that uh, people tried to fly supersonically and uh, because they didn't understand it they uh, they thought they could engineer their way out of it even if they didn't understand it and they were wrong they lost test pilots because the pressure distribution was far different from what they thought. Now, I mentioned last time that this, in the far field, this, these shock waves are parabolas. Now, I want to try and motivate that for you. Why would that be true? Well, here is the compression, so here's the shock, and here's the expansion, and so these marked lines from the expansion here diverge, so this is uh, isentropic flow here, and the pressure falls, and they begin to weaken the shock wave. And uh, I haven't done it, but one of the characteristics of a shock wave is that these characteristics on the downstream side of the shock are at the same angle to the shock as the characteristics on the upstream side. So that's, of course, in the far field. Now, what you could do is, those of you who know something about parabolas would know that the reason why um, antenna are typically parabolas is that they take parallel light and then they focus it at a focal point. So, uh, what happens here, you can imagine, see these characteristics here in this uniform flow. If you're far away from this corner, they're all parallel, and they make an equal angle with these characteristics here. Uh, so you can think of these parallel lines as if they were extended all the way over here, and they're parallel lines like rays of light that come in here and then get focused at this point here. So that's a parabola. Something that does that is a parabola. Um, <clears throat> so this shock wave doesn't die out. It just gets attenuated as you go further and further away. And its shape is the shape of a parabola. And there's one from the front of the airfoil or the front of the aircraft and the other one from the back <coughs> of it. So I've said there that it's uh, approximately a parabola. And um, oh, I can't move it over for some reason. Anyway, I think... This word is approximately a, a, a parabola in the far field. And uh, the case that I'd like to draw your attention to is here's the flat plate. Here's a flat plate, or a lifting line it's sometimes called, and it's at a slight angle to the free stream velocity. How many of you know that the lift coefficient for a flat for a, uh, a lifting line in two-dimensional flow, which is incompressible, it, CL is two pi alpha. 
How many of you know that? Not a single soul. Good God. That's depressing. Well, you should know that a lifting line, if you approximate an airfoil like a line, as if it were a straight line, a, a, a flat plate, it has zero drag, and its lift coefficient, that's the lift divided by a half rho u squared, CL, times the chord, CL is 2 pi alpha. And that was, that's a famous result. You could actually get it by a Joukowsky transformation of uh, the flow around the circular cylinder. <clears throat> but in the, supersonic, in the case of supersonic flow, what, what would be going on? Well, here, the flow's coming along, and now it's turning. Because of this plate here, it must, the flow must finish up parallel to the plate. Well, here... This flow is turned towards the shock, so it compresses, and so there's a shock on this side. But on this side here, the flow is expanding around that corner, and so this is an expansion fan here, where all the characteristics fan out. <clears throat> and then it's parallel to the surface here, and parallel to the surface here, and now, what has to happen is that sooner or later you have to go through some kind of a compression here because this is lower pressure than it is here. This has uh, been through a shock wave. This has been through an expansion. So this is higher pressure here than here. And that difference, that difference in pressure is the same all the way along there. And uh, that pressure times the area, that pressure difference times the length will be the force per unit width. And, and um, so that'll be the lift. And uh, the lift is the force in, it, it, perpendicular to the free stream. So it's this, um, and uh, so it's the cosine of the angle of attack. And um, why can't I make this smaller? Can I make it smaller? Morgan, you'd have thought you'd have thought I could just move it with that button, but I can't. Uh, maybe just make it just there. All right. Thank you. So there's an expression for the lifts. This force acts in this way. So this angle, small angle here, is alpha. So the lift force in this direction is the pressure times the chord. It's the force in this direction, and it's the cosine of this small angle, whereas the drag is the component of the force in this direction in this direction, so it's the sine of alpha. But it neglects friction, of course, and friction plays a role. <clears throat> of course, in the incompressible case, the, uh, the induced drag, you have to include the induced drag because the lift from the, is now, the velocity with respect to the airfoil is not exactly U infinity, but it's tilted because of the trailing vortex system. And the trailing vortex system will, in, will lead to the lift being at an angle to the free stream velocity. And so there's an induced drag because of the trailing vortex system. And that is the reason why the uh, Spitfire had elliptic wings, was to try and minimize the induced drag. <clears throat> People haven't been so preoccupied with uh, these days you can just compute it and it doesn't make as much difference as people thought it would. <clears throat> However, that's what was done in the Second World War. Now, so I, I do want you to understand the difference between this expansion on this side and compression on this side, compression on this side and expansion on this side for that very simple case. So it's a supersonic flow, and that's what you would get. And it has a lift and a drag, even in the inviscid case, it has a drag. So that's a very important point. 
some of you would know, the reason why there's only a few, um, 13, I think, were built, Concords, is, is because L over D, the lift to drag of the Concord, is about eight. The lift to drag of a 787 is about 18. So uh, since you've got a, the lift is how many people are, are on board and the structure plus the fuel, uh, you're paying a lot of extra fuel to fly a Concorde from uh, London to New York than if you went in a 787. And that's why there aren't many. <clears throat> that's precisely why there aren't many. It's uh, relatively inefficient. Now, here's something that I want to tell you about because I'd be embarrassed if you'd taken this course and you'd never heard of Crocker's theorem. But this is not for the exam. So, but I want to tell you about it anyway. So what's Crocker's theorem? Well, you've seen, uh, you know that for inviscid flow, this is the mass times the acceleration or rho. This is uh, grad P over rho here. So this is a rho out in front. Rho times the acceleration is minus the gradient of pressure. So I can divide by rho, and I get minus grad P over rho here. And you also know that the thermodynamic identity is that TDS is dH minus dP over rho, or VDP minus dP over rho. So at any time, from this relationship here, I can write that ds is grad, the gradient of ds dot dr. So the change in any dr. So if I make dr, I can put dr dot dr around this, and since dr is arbitrary, then uh, it must be true that this is equal to that. So from this, t times the gradient of s is equal, minus the gradient of H will be minus the gradient of P over rho. So where I've said the gradient there they, uh, implies three partial, uh, three derivatives, partial derivatives of the pressure or the enthalpy or the entropy. Now the other thing that I want to use is the fact that U cross, curl cross U, so that's U cross omega, so how do I work this out? How do I remember it? I don't remember the formula. I just know how to do it. What is a triple product? A triple um, A cross B cross C is A dot C B minus A dot B C. That's how I remember it. So <clears throat> A dot C is U dot U, and then B will be the gradient of it. But because the gradient is a special kind of vector, it's a derivative, I'll have to put the half in there. And uh, I get the right answer if I put a half in there. So it's a dot c b minus a dot b, which is u dot grad u. So this is an expression for u dot grad u, which I can put in there. And you've seen me do this before. So if I take this across to the right-hand side, and this is u cross omega, and if I take it to the other side, it's omega cross u. So um, u dot grad u, I'll have du dt plus the gradient of a half u squared plus omega cross u is equal to the minus the gradient of p over rho, which is t, the gradient of entropy, minus the gradient of entropy. So that is essentially uh, Crocco's theorem. Luigi Crocco was an Italian, very clever fellow, who... Um, has did a number of things in fluid mechanics, and this is one of them. <clears throat> Crocco's theorem. So what you can see, it's not very, uh, not very difficult to follow. Um, what you can see is that uh, if I take the gradient of h to this side, and I put the gradient of h plus a half u squared, and h plus a half u squared is the total enthalpy, h naught. So I've, 
in fact, what I've done is, uh, yes, I've brought this across to this side. So I have T, the gradient of S, is the gradient of H naught plus du dt plus omega cross u. So that's Croco's general theorem. And um, for stationary flow, for stationary flow, and if H naught is a constant everywhere, and it's even a constant across shock waves, as we've seen, then we get T, the gradient of S, is omega cross u. And that's uh, very important because it says that if there's a gradient in entropy, and you know from what you've seen me do, that if the flow has been through two shocks versus one shock, then typically they have different changes in entropy because the change in entropy goes like delta P over P cubed. So they will have different entropies. And if they have different entropies, it automatically means that omega will be not zero. So the gradient of S leads to the uh, vorticity not being zero or turning it another way around, if omega is identically zero everywhere, it implies that S is uniform, provided H naught is uniform. So that's a, uh, and uh, that, that theorem the general theorem here, if, uh, if I use natural coordinates, and you're going to see me do something later in a minute uh, using natural coordinates. Natural coordinates, one coordinate is, is along the streamline, and the other coordinate is normal to it. So if we, if we had those two coordinates, and we say, well, let's have a right-hand coordinate system, then that will, the one turning into the other, the first turning into the second will produce the third. And so, um, in two-dimensional flow, In two-dimensional flow, if S is measured along a streamline and, and N is measured normal to the streamline, then the direction of the vorticity is perpendicular to that, and it's a right-hand rule. And so this Crocco relationship becomes very simple, that if I have a gradient in entropy in the normal direction, which I'll have if uh, the flow's been through two different shocks, T times dS dN will be equal to dH naught dN if there is a gradient in total enthalpy, often there's not, plus U times zeta, where zeta is the component of the vorticity perpendicular to the direction of the velocity. So that's a two-dimensional flow, and there's only one component of vorticity in two-dimensional flow. Now, I also want to um, do something because I'd be embarrassed if you'd uh, said you'd taken a course in compressible gas dynamics and you'd never heard of characteristics. So you're going to have to hang on while I do it in uh, five minutes. Um, but I'm going to do it in a way that I hope you can understand, at least understand. So. <clears throat> What is the method of characteristics? And if so, this is not for an exam. This is just for your entertainment. And uh, because I'd be embarrassed if you'd taken a course and, and somebody asked you and you said you'd never heard of it. Well, I talked about it in uh, acoustics and in XT diagram. And now I want to talk about it in the spatial case. And so in, quote, natural coordinates, that is S measured along a streamline and N measured normal to a streamline, the mass and momentum equations reduce to something terribly simple and symmetric. 
they reduce to these two equations. D D S of the Prandtl-Meier function nu minus the angle theta is uh, plus the tan of mu, where mu is the um, Mach angle, is d d n of mu minus theta equals zero. And the other one, the other equation from the energy equation is that d d s of mu plus theta is minus tan mu d d n mu plus theta equals zero. Now, the idea of the method of characteristics is that there is some particular curve, typically as a function of x and t, or as a function of x and y, or in this case as a function of s and n, some particular curve along which, in this case, nu minus theta and nu plus theta behave in very simple ways. So that's the heart of it. There is some special curve along which you don't have to work very hard to work out what's happening. Something is either constant or nearly constant. Good God, what is that? <laughs> okay. Rabbits or rats? <laughs> So here's, here is, in a nutshell, the method of characteristics. And I can tell you, when I first did this, it was done in such a way that I had not the foggiest clue what was going on. And uh, I never worked out what was going on. Good heavens. I never worked out what was going on until I took a course from uh, Jerry Whittam, who wrote a wonderful book called Linear and Nonlinear Waves. And he was a master uh, of applied mathematics and made everything plain. So now, here's the idea. Supposing that S was a function of some parameter lambda, and n was also a function of some parameter lambda. Supposing that were true, then I could go back to this first equation here and say, well, if, this, if that were true, then that would mean that u minus theta, uh, I would expect is also a function of lambda because it's a function of s and n, so it must be a function of lambda. And so my question is, what is d d lambda of nu minus theta? Well, just mathematically, d d lambda of nu minus theta would be d d s of nu minus theta d s d lambda plus d d n of nu minus theta d n d lambda. Now, that's just mathematics here. But the reason why that equation looks like this one is because you'll notice that the right-hand side is zero. So why don't I make some choice now and say, well, why don't I put ds d lambda equal to 1 up in here? So I've got 1 there. In which case, I can integrate this thing, and it's telling me that apart from a constant, s is equal to lambda. <clears throat> and now my d n d lambda, why don't I choose that to be tan mu? D n d lambda, if, if I make d n d lambda equal to tan mu, in other words, <clears throat> n is small n, dn, and lambda is equal to s. So it's really dn ds is equal to tan mu. If I do that, then this equation is the same as the first equation on the left-hand side, and so this thing has to be zero all the way along. That is amazing. That is the heart of the method of characteristics.
wait a minute, we do in the first equation, if you rewrite momentum and energy, you have tan mu in here. So what I'm going to choose is the nd lambda is equal to tan mu. So then it's exactly the same as that equation following the motion. But I found something very simple that d d lambda of nu minus theta will in that case, in that particular case, it'll be zero. Or if d d lambda of this thing is zero, it means that nu minus theta is a constant. And I'm going to call it r. And so there's a particular curve, the NDS is equal to tan mu. <clears throat> and if I go along that curve, then nu minus theta should be a constant and equal to r. And similarly, the other equation will be, there's a minus in there. There's a minus there. So, And the other one then is nu plus theta will be a constant is equal to q on the NDS is minus tan mu. So here's mu, here's the direction of the flow, this is the Mach angle, and here is the NDS, so that's the normal, and here's the S and that's tan mu. So along that particular line, nu minus theta is a constant and equal to r. Whereas along this line, this particular line, nu um, plus theta is a constant q. So that's a very remarkable fact. And so how would I use it? If I were computing, I'd have a mesh point here at 1 and a mesh point here at 2. And let's suppose I knew at this point here, u1, a1, and theta1, the direction of the flow. And at this point here, I knew u2, a2, and theta2. Then this characteristic on, on which, <coughs> so tan of mu is constant along this characteristic. And on this characteristic, I have nu plus theta is equal to a constant q, and on this one, nu minus theta is a constant equal to r. So, <clears throat> at 3, those two things have to be equal. So, nu 3 plus theta 3 has got to be equal to nu 1 plus theta 1, which is equal to q 1, and that's on this negative characteristic. And on this positive characteristic here, nu 3 minus theta 3 is equal to nu 2 minus theta 2. And that's equal to r2. So you can see that I could work out what's going on at point 3 here. Because I can just add these two here and I get twice nu 3 is equal to um, <coughs> a half of nu 1 plus nu 2 plus a half of theta 1 minus theta 2. Theta 1, I'm adding these two, and these cancel, so I get 2 nu 3. And I can get theta 3 by subtracting this equation from this, and that gives me a half nu 1 minus nu 2 plus a half theta 1 plus theta 2. So... <coughs> Right here, if I know u2, a2, and theta2, I know the Mach number at this point here. I know nu2, and I know r nu minus theta. <clears throat> I know theta2, and uh, I know this angle, which is this one upon the sine of beta. So I can work it out, and I can work out what is the condition of 3. And if I found another point down here, I find a point four, and I could find it, and I have a marching solution. So I can go from upstream all the way through the flow, and I'm going to show you how you would use that in a minute. 
So <clears throat> if I know nu3, which is a half of q1 plus r2, and theta3 is a half of q1 minus r2, if I know nu3, then I know from the Prandtl minor function, I know m3. And if I know m3 and I'm given t naught, I know t3. And if I know t3 from, if it's a perfect gas, I know a3. If I know the Mach number, I know u3. And if I know the Mach number, I know p3. So I know everything there is to, that I would like to know about this flow, and I can march. So now, here's a good example of the way it's used. People try to compute supersonic nozzles or rocket nozzles. So this is a rocket nozzle. How do you actually shape the rocket nozzle? Well, what actually happens? So the flow's coming along here, and it's supersonic. And now I'm going to expand it out here. <clears throat> well, that's not exactly how it works. It's expanded all the way from the throat, just downstream of the throat. <clears throat> but uh, let's imagine that this Mach number is just less, just a little bit more than one. Then I have a characteristic here. Um, <clears throat> uh, on which nu plus a theta is a constant. And I have another characteristic. This is an expansion fan here where the flow is expanding around this corner. And it expands to a nu 2 and a theta 2. <clears throat> and um, nu plus theta is a constant on that. Uh, uh, is, nu plus theta is a constant on this lower characteristic here, coming from below, coming up here, going through here, and uh, reaching this point here. So at this point here, all the way along that characteristic, nu plus the theta is equal to nu2 plus theta2. And now we can take this characteristic down here, nu plus the theta is also equal to nu3, because theta here is right on the axis, and theta has to be zero. So this is a very powerful way of actually calculating, doing the engineering of a supersonic nozzle. The method of characteristics is the way it's done. People want to avoid shock waves in this nozzle. And how do they do it? They, they calculate it uh, by the method of characteristics, so they don't get a shock wave. All right, um, so just one more point in here is that um, nu minus theta on this line here, uh, sorry, nu minus theta on this line here will be the same as nu 1. And <clears throat> all the way on this line up, into here, nu2 minus theta2 will be equal to nu1, the value here. And then on this characteristic, this plus, this is a minus characteristic, minus tan mu, nu plus theta will be nu2 plus theta2, and that will be the same value here where theta is equal to zero, and that will be nu3. So if I know the Prandtl Meyer function at 3, nu 3, that's a function of Mach number, and that will be equal to nu 2 plus theta 2. But nu 2 is equal to nu 1 plus theta 2. So it's nu 1 plus 2 theta 2. So if I turn this flow here, theta 2, I can find from the Mach number upstream here and the prandtl meyer function, I can find what the Mach number is here. And it's, it's the prandtl meyer function here plus twice this turning angle through this throat. And that gives you what's sometimes called the test rhombus for a uh, supersonic wind tunnel in which the Mach number is uniform. And it'll be... <clears throat> uniform until you get this reflected wave coming back here. So inside this region here is where you'll have uniform Mach number. All right, well, um, that's all just for your amusement. 
and you can look at it. Um, you don't have to follow it in everlasting detail, but I hope I've said enough for you to get the idea that in supersonic flow, both in the steady and the time-dependent case, what becomes very important is the idea of particular lines, particular curves, along which something behaves simply. And in the, uh, in the linear case, which is the case I did, for the linear case, it was following the speed of sound. If I had done the nonlinear case, I'd have to add u to the speed of sound. And the speed of sound's not constant everywhere, and so it's, you have to be a little bit careful. Um, but I didn't do it. I didn't have time. In, uh, but I thought I should actually say something about it in the spatial case, because the spatial case, it becomes invaluable. If, any of you are going to design rocket nozzles, you're going to find some people who are doing it by the method of characteristics, and they've got a computational code that's solving the compressible gas dynamics by the method of characteristics. It's a pretty big rabbit. <laughs> Maybe it's several rabbits. It's a cat or a dog or something, I don't know. That's unreal. <laughs> All right. So that, I hope, is enough to uh, whet your appetite. Now um, we have only one lecture left tomorrow, and what I want you to do is come to the lecture tomorrow with any question or any part of what I've done that you feel is less than clear uh, and I'll try and explain it again. I had a good question before this class today about why I had used a dummy suffix L when we were talking about uh, the equations of motion, and I worked out that pi i as a function of the normal n, pi with the force in the direction i, was pi j i n k. And uh, <coughs> um, pi k i n k, I mean, pi k i. And the, when the suffix is repeated, you have to add the three components. So you have to, and it comes about because there are three normal components from which you can get the force, and I think I showed you roughly how to do that. So um, tomorrow you should come with any question that you feel you would like clarified. Maybe you have some now. Um, well, it might. It might emit from the duct a shock wave, which goes off to infinity, and uh, you hear it. Um, an explosion, generally speaking. I mean, that's why uh, Hiroshima was so devastating, because the pressure behind that shock was so high that it took roofs off buildings, and uh, the temperature was extremely high, and nobody survived. It's unreal, unreal what was released when that sun was released. I mean, that's the way to think about it. A sun at 5,000 feet above the Earth's atmosphere, above the surface of the Earth, it's incredible. The temperature was so high, the radiation was so intense, the shock wave was so great that it destroyed everything. So um, you're saying if an engine backfires, well, uh, that's an explosion. And so it could produce a shockwave. Yes, it could. It could produce a shockwave. Yes? Why can the solar sun fly to decrease the area of the airport? 
Well, you can see that uh, they would like to decrease the area of the airfoil. And uh, the other thing they tried to do was swing the wings. Barnes Wallace, the fellow who did the uh, dam busters with a table tennis ball, rotating table tennis ball, very clever chap. Barnes Wallace had the idea that you could fly supersonically if you could land subsonically and then with a large enough engine propel yourself to supersonic speeds but have a delta wing that folded the wings in close to the body and so the normal component of velocity was subsonic. That's what he tried to do. Not a very successful idea, a clever idea, but not very successful because the wing pivot fitting was very complicated and ultimately failed in fatigue, in fatigue. So um, the, the Concorde doesn't do that. The Concorde has delta wings and relies on very large angles of attack and very high trailing vortices, which is why the drag, why the induced drag is so high on the Concorde. So what was your question again? Why did the area of the wing go down? Well, you want, you don't want, you don't want a, uh, a normal shock in front of the wing. So if you have a wing that doesn't have a sharp point, you'll have a normal shock in front of it and a normal shock will give rise to large changes in entropy. So you don't want a normal shock. So they have very thin wings, small angle of attack, and you'd like to have nearly attached flow. Nearly attached flow. So you have a weak a shock, a weak shock, a bleak shock, and provided you, you don't have to turn the flow through 90 degrees, uh, well, you'd have to turn it 90 degrees if you had a bluff body. But if you don't have a bluff body, if you have a, an angle, you have to turn the flow. Okay. No? A am I making myself plain? Ask me if I'm not plain. I can't bear it if I'm not... Comp if, you, if you don't understand what I'm saying, I can't bear it. So... Uh, the last thing you should be doing is sitting there like blotting paper listening to everything I say. That's hopeless. You'll never learn anything. You have to, you have to be thinking while I'm talking. You have to be thinking while I'm talking. Trying to connect what I'm saying with something that you've heard me say previously. Or, so here's, here's the case that I talked about. So here, this was a case where I had this uh, uh, supersonic flow and it was attached. And here it is as well. And this is what, if you could turn the flow and you didn't have, if you could turn the flow and you didn't have to have a normal shock out the front, then you're, you're ahead. And you'd like it to be as thin as possible because you pay a price, even if you have a flat wing, infinitesimally thin, you'll pay a price if it's supersonic flow because there's a drag. The pressure underneath is different from the pressure above right? because one flow has been through an expansion and the other flow has been through in a compression. So here it is here. So this pressure here is, is simply this flow is parallel to the surface and this pressure is higher than this pressure because it's been through a shock and this pressure is lower than the pressure upstream because it's been through an expansion. So, so there's a net force perpendicular to the plate even if it's infinitesimally thin. Even if it's infinitesimally thin. Anything else? So are you saying you can avoid a normal shock in front of, in supersonic flow, you can avoid a normal shock in front of the wing? Well, 
Uh, in reality, no. But people would like to. People would like to. So, um, for example, you have intake into this engine. So you've, you've got to bring the flow back to something subsonic to burn in the combustor. So uh, typically, you're going to have to do that through weak shocks. You don't want a normal shock stuck there in the middle of this intake. So you'd like to do it through oblique shocks. And uh, so people go out of their way to avoid normal shocks. Yeah, anything else? Well, I'm going to quit today early. Um, tomorrow, you must come back and have any question you want to ask. You can be absolutely certain, if you have a question, there's at least half the class who have the same question and not courageous enough to ask it. So any question, any question you want to ask, you can ask tomorrow. And you should. OK, I quit. the shock to slow the vehicle down. But, so you need the normal shock there? You sure do. And they, they, they come in at, uh, you know, at an angle, so there's a huge normal shock. And they use it to slow the vehicle down. The price they pay is the temperature. Behind that shock is very hot flow, and that's why they ablate the surface with tiles that... Uh, uh, give off a gas and protect, try and protect the crew from very high temperature. Yes, and also another thing about the attachable. The attachable. Uh, I think I not understand this very well. When, what is the condition to try uh, for uh, for we shop to have unattachable, the attachable? Ah, well, I showed you the shock polar. Yes. yes. And that has a maximum theta, even, even for an infinite Mach number, there's a maximum theta at which you have a normal shock or an oblique shock. And, uh, so there's, a, there's an angle between um, zero and pi on two. There's an angle where theta is the maximum value. And there's a Mach number that goes along with that. That theta is a function of Mach number. Yes, so if theta is bigger than that, it will be detachable. If theta is bigger than that, it will be detached. You won't be, you won't be able to have a, a, an attached yes. flow. And what are some applications that I need? I need to deattach de the... To attach, to, to have an unattached yes. flow? Well, if I have a, a, a normal shock anywhere, if I have to bring the flow to rest uh, with a stagnation point, I can't do that and have a supersonic flow. I'll have to have a normal shock standing off from the vehicle. And, and the normal shock will give me subsonic flow behind it, and I can bring the flow to rest. So a normal shock is an example of deattached? A normal shock is an example of a detached flow. Oh, detached flow. Yes, where the shock is, isn't at the corner. Whereas if I have a flow that remains supersonic everywhere, then that, where the flow turns, is where I have the shock hitting the, hitting the body. And everywhere inside that region, I can have the same turning angle of the flow. So I match the body. Yeah. 
So can can we say uh, can we say I don't know if this is correct, but can we say if the if if the solution is weak solution, that means we we are not having the attached. Uh, that's right. If it's a weak solution, then you'll have attached waves, and there's some there's some feature in the flow probably that is. Uh, you can draw a streamline, and the, and the body that has created this flow is that streamline. I want about if I have strong, strong solution. The strong solution, well, I may have the shock. Uh, it produces a subsonic flow, and um, that's typically quite a difficult problem. The subsonic flow is much more difficult because you don't have the matching solution of these characteristics, for example. So I can't say if it is the attach or not. The strong solution. The strong solution is almost un, uh, not attached. The wave is not attached. Yes, yes. The, the, because the strong solution, if it's subsonic, the pressure is going to depend on the boundary conditions. The flow is going to be very dependent upon boundary conditions, mm. and I won't be able to satisfy him. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, good. Okay. Tomorrow. Yes. So I've got to, uh, I've got to do something tonight, so I'm the reason why I'm leaving a bit early. The system. I think I can hear some birds in the pipe. <laughs> what, what on earth is that? I have no idea. Maybe some animals got small animals got trapped in it. I, I, I felt like so. that's what's happening. <laughs> For I, I don't know what I do. It's, it's, uh, it's a possum or um, birds. Yeah, it sounds like bird. But it, it was running all the way yeah, down yeah. there. So uh, I don't know where it is. <laughs> I can still hear it. <laughs> All right, we should quit. Oh, I've got to get my jacket. Yeah, right.